Hi, hello, and welcome to this episode of In Plain Sight. In keeping a the theme with the name of our show today, we're going to be talking about something we all experience, but we may not think much about, eating with our families and how that experience was with our families growing up and, and what we do with our families now. And to start us off, uh, Tin, you want to tell us what drink you're drinking today? Oh, yeah. So I guess it's been two weeks since I've been here, right? And here I'm trying to get off of this podcast so I can get bad because I'm old. But um, did I bring a troll 6 drink? 6 p.m., man. Did, did, I bring a, did, did I bring a troll drink last time? Uh, no, no. You you ended the troll drink and you brought like a uh, Stella or something. Oh, well, you know. So so like Andy, I um, I love Scottish whiskey. Scotch, whatever you want to call it. But I almost exclusively drink Scotch from Isla. Good because man. it's super, super peaty. And, you know, uh, it's it's crazy how many distilleries they have over in Scotland, um, despite its size. And I think Isla has nine working distilleries. And, you know, Andy and I, I, I think we've drank most of them. There's Lafroig. They might know us by name. What's that? They might yeah. know us by name. Co- Coelho is one of my yeah. favorites. Uh, and, you know, I said almost exclusively because... I also like Talisker, and that's from Isla Sky, but it's also Petey. But, you know, what I brought today is a really good entry-level Isla Scotch. Uh, it's Artbeg. Yep. And Artbeg has a nice smokiness to it, and it's under 50 bucks, which is in competition with Lafroy 10-year, right? Uh, and they both have a medicinal taste to it while still being really peaty and really smoky, even though it doesn't compare to something like a Log 16 or a Coelho 12. Uh, it's a really good start for somebody who wants to get into scotch. It's a, it's a fantastic scotch. And, you know, I think I've had everything in Isla, except for, uh, except for uh, Ardenhoe. And uh, I, perhaps that's the only thing that I haven't drank from Isla. And, uh, you know, I say that this is a good beginner uh, scotch from Isla, but at the same time, I think Lafroig is a better deal uh, because if you drink Lafroig, they give you an honorary ownership to one square foot of land on Isla. And, you know, what you can do with that, I, I don't know, but at least you can say you own one square foot of land, right? Uh, you don't get that from Ardbeg. Uh, I'm drinking like a peasant today, though, because this isn't even like a sake cup or anything. It's a ramekin. It was the only thing I could find at the time because all my <laughs> whiskey glasses. You didn't have any on. sippy cups? Oh, yeah, well, I did have sippy cups, but all my lowball glasses were dirty. So are you getting the notes of ranch? Ranch? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Some raw hey, raw you, eggs. Yeah. You know, um, what's uh what's your favorite Isla? Um, Annie, I know you know you prefer what Highlands? You know, oh no, no, no. I prefer I prefer Isla for sure. Okay. Um, but uh my favorite is always gonna be the Cowila. Mm-hmm. And it's it's because I, I equate a lot of my um liquor to just like hanging out with friends and Cowila, if you remember, was our first introduction into right. Scotch. So it's always going to be my favorite. Right. It, you know, um, it, I think they're all really good. I think they're definitely all really good. And I think that the major difference between the $50 bottles, which I think is where you can find the entry level bottles, the lowest cost one from Isla, right? All the way up to hundreds and thousands of dollars. And the more you spend on an Isla bottle, the peatier it gets. Uh, and, you know, I had mentioned Talisker. It's peaty too, which, I'll bring Talisker on here one day. I just thought it was really cool. I was reading up on Talisker the other day and the water that they collect to make the Talisker whiskey runs over beds of peat. So, cool. you know, it's got that extra, I guess, peatiness to it. If that even, that's even a thing, right? I'm, I'm not a sommelier, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, our bag is a fantastic scotch for 50 bucks. Matt, you got to get into scotch, man. It's, it's an excellent, Excellent drink that tastes like campfire. I mean, it's slightly better than the 7 Eleven beer you had last week, but yeah. Slightly. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't too bad after a while. What you got, Andy? Uh, so uh, I went with a beer today. Uh, this is called Smutty Nosed Drops of Dawn. It's a tangerine IPA. My lighting is terrible for this. 
Um, I think it's a beer out of like Wisconsin or something. Oh. Um, nope, nope. I was close. Uh, New Hampshire. Uh, so it's it's uh it's it's interesting. I'm I'm not a huge fan of IPAs. I got this one on a recommendation. Um, I, I already took a couple sips already. Not gonna lie, it's it kind of tastes like the beer version of orange juice uh, without all the sweetness. No kidding. Uh, yeah, it's it's really good. I'm getting no hoppiness whatsoever. It's smooth. It's it's like what is this? Five point six percent alcohol. Like so, so that's that's surprising, right? To find an yeah. IPA that's at five percent and that doesn't taste hoppy. I, I always I always kind of took uh microbreweries that focus on ipas as like the cheap way out of making beer yeah because you make yeah, it yeah. as hoppy and you know high gravity as possible get people drunk they don't care what it tastes like right and there's such a following with ipa like somebody's going to buy it so Damn. yeah I, I mean i got it i i typically don't like ipas and I, I was surprised this this doesn't it's not in your face bold it's it's smooth it's like an everyday kind of drink especially uh as we're wrapping up summer around here anyway Okay. Well, yeah, that's my drink. What do you have, Matt? All right. All right. So I'm going to be drinking something that's very uh, popular or common in Singapore. Uh, so in Singapore, there's a concept of hot and cold. Um, and when Same concept here in the United States, Matt. Really? It blows oh, your mind. yes. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> cold weather, hot weather. What is this? So after a pregnancy, women are deemed in a cold state they they are cold is what they say they're deemed so, cold yeah I like don't know does, how somebody, does somebody it come properly. in and like oh congratulations on the birth you're cold yes <laughs> <laughs> have some liquor <laughs> <laughs> that's so, dumb yeah it's dumb are you are you familiar with dumb wait it's well, 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 yeah, on easy yeah, there's a champagne that's <laughs> dumb on, right yeah. yeah so this is a Color. liqueur apparently and uh what kind of so, liquor does it say what's that what kind of liquor does it say it's a hot one it's a hot one <laughs> yeah it's a hot yes it is exactly that's what my <laughs> wife told me to say tell them it's a hot liqueur it makes you hot <laughs> it makes you hot well you yes. still look the same to me i don't know what to tell you oh. <laughs> you haven't drank any man yeah that's what i say i haven't drank any it's all- so <laughs> <laughs> so apparently after you give birth for the first month at- afterwards you're supposed to drink this regularly, and that includes while you're pumping. I don't know how to tell you this, but I think your wife lied to you after you had your first kid. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, like, because women, they, they say that after birth, they don't have all the nutrients they need. So drinking liquor is your nutrients. <laughs> yeah, this is why all those Olympians, they just like, they chug, man. <laughs> So this is a thing in Singapore. This article is about it. You could read about. So what's and, it taste uh, like? Let's see. All right. I'll be using my one piece glass. Nice. Nice. Hot liqueur. Do you need to think of microwave it or something? Or <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling so. this is going to be like a licorice liqueur. Oh, oh. Yeah. And oh, I'm going to yeah. feel so sorry for oh, you. If it's oh, a wow, oh, look what? at that color. What? Yeah, this is the color. What is that? Is that it's like really a dark. that's like a little drip? That's like a one cc drip. Yeah, I had to take uh, Joyce to the hospital later. So well, be maybe you guys can both go to the hospital. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I have my nutrients for today, so I'm good. My vitamins. I'm cool. Does it smell hot, Matt? I can't really smell very well. Oh, it smells pretty good, and tastes pretty good. What, what does it taste like? like? To me, it tastes a bit like rum. Okay. Interesting. Like a sweet, it's like a sweet rum. I don't have that the same palate as you guys do. I can't describe it very well, but it's nice. I like it much better than a Seven Eleven beer. <laughs> 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 Taste nutritious. Uh, you know, you you definitely give us uh, give our palates way too much credit. Yep. Oh, <laughs> mine at least. Although I don't think I'd ever buy a Seven Eleven beer, so maybe not. I would. I, I bought that one for the novelty. <laughs> that was interesting. It was. It I was. almost bought a four loco. I wouldn't so, drink it. You know. A four loco. Wow. Yeah. Four loco's got to make an appearance on our show one day. Only if they pay us. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> have you have you guys ever heard of that energy drink called Bang? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was. Okay. 
Yeah. So, you know, there's an alcoholic version of it called hard bang, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Matt. Nice. <laughs> well, so, so what it tastes like rum. Does it smell like anything like fruity wise or is it thick like a syrup? Uh, is it thin? Would you I have a potato it's... soup with it? <laughs> <laughs> potato soup. <laughs> anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It smells like liqueur. <laughs> there's a lot of different liqueurs. I, I cannot smell very well, so I have a, a weird nose. But uh, it smells like it tastes delicious. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that valuable insight, Matt. <laughs> yeah, no problem. All right. So today in our episode, we were talk we're gonna talk about um, meal time with our families. Uh, so for me, when I was like growing up. We actually didn't, um, my mom didn't cook too much. Uh, so we mostly just ate very simple meals or um, ate fast food. And we didn't really talk much around meal time. We would just sit around our, uh, the table in front of the TV and just watch TV for the, for the next hour or two, watch the reruns of Friends. Um, so, but one good thing that I, one of the good meals I, I think my mom was always very good at was uh, chicken and dumplings. And I feel like every family has their own uh, favorite uh, chicken and dumplings meal from their own mom. But I, to this day, I feel like even though it was a very simple chicken and dumplings meal, I still feel like it's the best that I've had. But uh, beyond that, we didn't really eat. We didn't really focus too much on meal time with our family growing up. It was just, all right, meal, here's your food on your own individual plates, go sit down around the table and watch some TV for the next few hours. What was it like for you guys? Uh, not that sad, that's <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Man, yes. riveting. Um, yes. I, I'll, I'll start, Tim, if that's all right. Um, yeah. So like family meals in my family was incredibly important. Like you could have had a falling out with everybody in the family. You still showed up to the dinner table and you ate with everybody else at the same exact time. Um, so like family meals was the time we were together period. Uh, we didn't do chicken and dumplings all too much. I mean, granted, I, I mean, we had it and uh, my dad was the primary cook and we had good chicken and dumplings, but it wasn't I don't know. He, he boiled the chicken, sometimes roasted it first, threw it in there, made his own chicken stock. Um, a lot of the times the dumplings would just be like one of those pot biscuits. He took it out and just like cut up some of the chunks and threw it in there. And that was the dumplings. Uh, but like the meals for us was more what my parents grew up with. So when my mother would do family meals, it would be, you know, we'd have a uh, omelet rice or um, bibimbap or something like that. When my dad would cook, it would be um, uh, red beans and rice or uh, uh, fried catfish and grits, uh, something like that. But everything, and, and I think this is important because of the chicken and dumplings that you were mentioned, like everything had a story, like there was, there was something to it. So it wasn't just a meal, it was a meal and a memory. And um, that's why I really like this topic and I'm excited to see where we go with this, but that, that, that's been my experience with family meals. In the past. Yeah. Thank goodness. Matt finally found himself a family, huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'll get into yeah. that a little bit later. Yeah, was, you know? yeah. Cause yeah, for me, cause with my experience with mealtime and that's why I kind of wanted to talk about this is that for me, I have disassociated mealtime with my family. In general, so even now, I, it's a bit weird for me. So associating family with meals, because even after I, I, you know, moved out of, out of my house, you know, for the next six years, I was living overseas by myself, just eating meals by myself for the most part. So meal time is not a thing that I'm used to right now. Actually, so now I'm going to call bullshit on that because we've had plenty of hot pot at my Thank house. You. Thank and we've seen you eat the shit out of that pot. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. And then some. Like, and we then some. would leave the table and you would still be going. Right. Like, I saw what you did to those little pizza pockets that one day, too. Yeah. So, <laughs> so this whole entire, uh, this, this feign of apprehension is, uh, it's bullshit. It's, it's bullshit. It's what it is. You know, it's, it's funny, though, because 
when I listened to that last episode, I thought this episode was specifically going to be about family style meals where, you know, we're not eating on our own plates. Well, we are, but we have this communal uh, plates of vegetables and protein and everything else. And we ate from those communal plates. And I was like, man, what a great topic to choose in the middle of COVID-19, right? But right. <laughs> but, I think about that a lot. Yeah, you know, we, we definitely still do that. It, it, it's, and that's how I grew up in my family. Um, we always ate together every single night. And we always ate family style dining. We were so close during the eating part of the day because that was the day that the entire family saw each other because my dad worked so much. We were at school. My mom was a stay at home mom for the most part of my life. And, you know, we even shared a cup of water between the four of us. Um, But we weren't like, uh, we weren't like the American sitcom where, you know, you sit around the table and, hey, Timmy, how'd school go today, right? We didn't really ever talk to each other. Uh, we just sat there, enjoyed our meal that my mom would cook. And then after the meal was done, we would get up from the table and go out and about our evening, uh, which, you know, I never found anything weird about it. But I tell you what, my mom can really cook. And yeah, she can. Yeah. Oh my God, she can. Oh, I miss that really? far so much. Yeah, but you know, oh. so can so can Andy's family though, because you know, I, <laughs> my family's been invited over to Andy's uh, family's house for barbecue before, and you know, it, and this is it, even talking about the extended family when all of the brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles come together, and it, you know, I know that this is also a thing of Western and white culture too is that we line up the large table with a buffet of food that we just kind of eat off of right Mm -hmm. but yeah you know family meals kind of always been in my family and it's it's a big thing in my family now with my wife and kids so you eat pretty similarly now with how how you used to with your past well so it's, it's a little bit different right my mom cooked every single day um i mean like i don't think there was ever a dinner that she did not cook unless if we had uh, a family party planned or we were going out to the buffet because that's all we're, that's all we ever went to. Um, but with my family, we don't cook every single night. Uh, so when we don't cook every single night, you know, we're still eating together, right? So if we're going out eating or bringing taken in, we're eating, but at the same time, I'm a little bit more liberal to the idea that occasionally we can go to our own spaces and do our own thing while we're eating, especially if we're still moving around once we get back from work or, you know, school or whatever else. My priority isn't necessarily having to eat as a family unit every single night. It's just as long as we do it on the occasion. And Cynthia has this tradition where we always cook Sunday morning breakfast and sit down and eat that together too. Now, what about you, man? Cause y- you have a family now that is, yes. I'm guessing, you know, us Asians, we, we eat together as families and now right. you're the minority in the family. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah, so that's, that's so that, like I said, that's why I kind of wanted to talk about this episode because I didn't realize this was an issue for me until recently. I didn't either. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> until today. Right. <laughs> I don't remember much for those times we were drinking a lot, but <laughs> no, no. So he, he mentioned it those times and we were much older, but when we were, when you and I were in middle school, you came over to my house. My parents cooked you family style dinners. Yeah. So it's not like you never had them. And it's not like, no, I'm not saying I never had it before. <laughs> I just be with my own personal family, like with my mom and stuff. Cause my dad was mostly in the middle East and everything so right. he was always away so it was just me my mom and my sister and my mom was never a cook <laughs> what about joyce and what's that what joyce? about joyce does joyce she cook, cook. <laughs> she she cooks and, she, and i does she yes so it's good. <laughs> but, but she does not cook singapore noodles because this doesn't because it doesn't exist <laughs> she's but in she singapore she just makes noodles through singapore noodles <laughs> right right yeah but when me and Joyce were first married, we, did, we ate a lot of pasta together. So it was just me and her eating pasta, watching movies and TV shows together. So, you know, that was fun. You know, I really enjoyed that experience, ex- that experience. And then, but now that I'm in Singapore, uh, it's a thing where it's a, it's a big family thing. Like, 
they have a we have a small table and we similar to 10 with his family we have a lot of sharing pots and apparently in singapore and chinese culture there's a thing where there's a saying where there's three meals and one soup so every night we have three sh big sharing pots of meals separate meals and one big pot of soup and you don't put the soup in your own bowl everyone is dipping their spoon in the same bowl over and over and even for that like like you said with covid <laughs> i can't be thinking that. Like, i mean you're already uh, living together so uh, yeah true it doesn't yeah, matter as much right but when we have like um even with like we have holiday dinners and stuff like that at least i'm used to it with my family in the states with my mom's side my dad's family we have big dinners i'm used to having a banquet table with a big with a bunch of hot pot type meals not hot pot or potluck sorry potluck meals and we would grab our portions and we go on our own separate ways and we just kind of move around so you them. never did like a heavy reserve kind of dinner where there would just be like tons of food and you kind of just pick it up you eat it and then you pick up something else and you eat that you've mm -hmm. never you never did a meal like that no no mm. never that's interesting at, le okay. at least if i did i don't remember it very well so mm -hmm. But, but it with Joyce's family, it's like that, though, like you're talking about, mm -hmm. where they when they have big family meals like this, where everyone comes together, they have the potluck table, and everyone just sits around it and just picks themselves, which I guess is probably, apparently pretty normal in the, in the States, not that with my family. <laughs> but yeah, for me, I, I mean, a... there's restaurants that do that, too. I mean, d dim sum's pretty popular for doing that as well. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think family style dinners where everybody's picking off of the same plates isn't quite as prevalent for the typical white and non like Asian cultures in the United States. Right. My, my wife was a little bit weirded out about it when we first started dating, but she she transitioned into it pretty well after tasting my mom's cooking. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so, so who does the cooking at your house, man? Uh, my uh, Joyce's mom, and she cooks every day, <laughs> and well, she's very good. Yeah. So, how does it feel? I mean, how does it feel from going from a family that never really ate together, never really put too much thought into a meal, uh, to a family that you know is food? Maybe food focus might not be the right words to describe it, but. Um, no, they are. It's like food permeates throughout Singaporean culture. It's all they, I wouldn't say that all they think about, but it's like, as they're eating, they're saying, what food should we eat next? You right. Know? And like supper is a big thing too. Like after you eat dinner, it's like, okay, what do we eat in the next few hours? <laughs> and Joyce's mom always puts in a lot of effort to cook different meals um, every day of the week. She doesn't try to repeat anything. Yeah. You know, I'm curious, though, because you went the opposite way, right, Matt? And I think Andy kind of went the opposite way, too, where you came from a large as soon as family. Said, as soon as he said chicken noodle soup, I was like, oh, I misunderstood what this was about. <laughs> so <laughs> I switched gears. <laughs> what about you, man? How's that? What about you and Steph and being a young family without that large family unit that you grew up with? You know, Matt's got that now, right? So I, I came, like, I learned to cook for a large family unit, right? So uh, we have a lot of leftovers, a lot of leftovers. So I cook, I cook every day. Um, uh, the days that I don't cook, Stephanie cooks. Um, we probably order in for one or two meals a week. Um, we've taken family meals to be, to like another step. So uh, at least half our meals every week will incorporate something that Stephanie grew in her garden. So we'll, we'll take something that she grew and I'll come up with a recipe in my head, or I'll, I'll just like find something in the joy of cooking or one of the other 10 million cookbooks that I have and just like incorporate it into our meal. So family meals for me, um, in the context that I think we're talking about here, and I'm going to take a step back and try to define it. I assume we're just talking about meals that we share with our families rather than the style of meal called family. Um, in that context, uh, I try to make sure once or twice a week, I bring a meal to the table 
that has some significance to the culture that I grew up in or the culture Stephanie grew up in. So we often have something Puerto Rican for Stephanie's side, or we have something from the South or Korean for my side. Um, and I always have that for uh, our son. Uh, I mean, he's, he's already eating kimchi. So like he's, <laughs> he's, he's doing great in my book. Um, Does he like it? Yeah. He didn't spit it out Ooh. or anything. I mean, wow. his favorite, like his favorite food right now is when I roast butternut squash he just really? I, I mean he loves butternut squash the oh. kid will just keep eating it it's oh, crazy nice. um but yeah i mean like i i take family meal time pretty seriously like to the point that when stephanie has to work late i don't we don't eat until stephanie gets home like everybody's around the table we sit there we we have the food either on the table or on the stove you make your plate or if it's heavy reserves you just kind of grab and go um most of the time uh i can make a uh, make uh, our son a plate other times we uh just like let him eat off our plate but yeah i mean that's kind of what family meal time has turned into for us it, it's just passing down a memory right do you have any like plans what you would like things to be like as Alex gets older? As he gets older, the hope, like I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I feel like I'm old enough to know that planning is stupid, but the hope is that he will join me uh, in the kitchen to like, so I can pass on the tradition of cooking some of these things and explain to him the story of how it started. Like I have a recipe upstairs passed down to my grandmother who passed it down to us for a pecan pie granted if you eat it there's a slight chance that you might die from a heart attack but <laughs> it's delicious pie um I, me- so, I remember a lot of your family meals were like that <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so uh, much butter <laughs> so much everything that was everything. crazy it's crazy to think about how you said if stephanie gets home late y'all don't eat until she gets home right if that was the situation that I was in, I would call that third dinner because <laughs> I would have eaten twice before Cynthia got home. <laughs> well, that's different. You're eating like 4,500 calorie, 4,500 calories a day, right? And it sucks. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. I, I can, I, I have a hard time with my 2000 calories. So yeah. So are you, are you, so since you're eating 4,500 calories of meals, uh, is your meal time different? from my family no yeah. because i do have third dinners fifth lunch <laughs> and second <laughs> breakfast right is that I, I i'm always eating but at the same time there's always that time in a day where we try to sit down and have dinner together like today um you know i i had what i had i had a, a large uh, jimmy john sub i had four tacos i had a couple of curry buns i had i, had, I, I just oh, ate a lot buns. right oh. and then <laughs> when uh when cynthia and the kids got home uh one of our friends came over as well and i went out and got some uh chicken katsu uh tonkatsu made from chicken and we all sat around the table and ate together um and once we're done with this podcast before i go to bed i'm gonna eat again <laughs> so <laughs> yeah i always have that time with them try right yep yeah so i was i was saying earlier that like for me i i'm still getting used to eating with my family i feel like when we have like these big uh shared meals i feel like i don't know what to do with myself and it's something i've been kind of struggling with the last year well, or what so. would you say that you want um your daughter to get out of your family meals like pretend we get we, we're, we're discussing now like how it affected us in our in our past uh, how how our family meals affected us in our past what would you want your daughter to be saying when she's our age that's a that's a good question and i and i from the from the very beginning as soon as i knew joyce was pregnant with riley i wanted i wanted her to have that big family life i wanted her to experience that I want something in, which i didn't have in the states so i i when i when we have meal times i want riley to had that feeling, you know, like all the family together, eating meals, talking, having fun, joking. So I want her to have that experience. And I think she is getting that. She, she's already sitting at a table in a proper chair <laughs> with no baby chair or anything, just like watching us. 
<laughs> listening to us talk. <laughs> and she's so calm. She's so patient. <laughs> so she doesn't eat with you guys? Huh? She doesn't eat with you guys? No, she doesn't eat with us right now. Okay. But, uh, usually we t- kind of take turns where um, me and Joyce, because I'm usually at night, I'm, I'm teaching, I'm working. Mm-hmm. So I don't always eat with the family even now. Um, okay. So I usually eat before everyone else or after everyone else. Um, but so we would usually be eating at the table while Joyce or her mom will be feeding Riley or, or we switch places. So she, Riley doesn't normally eat with us, but she wants to be with us though. So oh, as she good. gets all there, she'll do that. Okay. I've got a question for you, both of you guys. It, Matt, I know this eating as a family thing is relatively new to you. Um, but what do you, Andy, what did you get from it? And Matt, what do you think you'll get from it? Uh, and let me, let me put some foundation here is, is that I ate with my family every single day. Right. Um, but I'm not close with my family. So, so what's the value of eating together as a family to you? Andy. Uh, sure. Um, so I, I think, the value is to like maintain that connection. Um, especially with, so the, the, hmm. we were talking about before how you were saying you feel a bit more liberal, uh, 10 these days than you, um, when you were younger, it was okay to have these meals, you'd separate out. And, you know, if your family decided to go someplace else to enjoy their meal, no big deal. Um, I think, in that respect, like in this modern age where your phone disconnects you from the reality in which you're sitting in, it makes it, it makes it both easier and harder to have those family meals. So I think your, your question is what, what I want to get out of those family meals and it's just the connection. So if I can have those family meals and we can be separated out, we can enjoy a movie together it doesn't really matter that it's at the din- dining table. It doesn't matter that we're doing a family style dinner. It doesn't matter that I'm passing down a memory because I'm creating a new one. Um, it just matters that I get to spend time with my family, uh, whether, whether it's, you know, past Andy talking or future Andy talking it. And it's those memories that I think are important um, as, as Americans. And unfortunately that's kind of the only perspective that us three have food is food encompasses a lot of what we consider to be happiness um and when we think about family we often think about food or at least i think us three do um so so i I think what i'd want and and I'm, i'm answering the question that i also gave matt what i'd want my son to get out of it is you know when food was on the table, it didn't matter what kind of mood you were in, you were in a good place and you were in a place that people respected your opinion. And that, that's, that's what I want out of that. I, I, want, I want that comfort feeling like it doesn't matter who you are or where you are in your life, you're welcome at my table. Yeah, I think I feel that, I think I share that same feeling where I, for me, when Riley, as she goes up and what I would like to get out of family meal time is that I know as Riley gets older or as we all get older, we're all going to be busy with our own lives. And I feel like meal time is going to be those one of those few rare times in our day where we can actually all sit together at once, you know, and share our, what our days would like, like catch up with um, our lives. And, and as you said, like talk about our opinions on whatever's in the news recently or just topics in general. And just like feel like that would be a good way to catch up with everyone, make sure that we're all on the same page, we're all family, you know, and we're actually like focusing on each other instead of our, our phones and whatever else we're doing in our life. So yeah, I I think so. I I guess I want to put it, uh, bring up another point. I don't limit the family meal time to um my kid my wife and my my siblings and my parents when i'm when i'm at the table with good friends and it's a meal that somebody there cooked that's a family meal to me that's i'm i'm i've i'm taking part into an activity that somebody 
actually spent a lot of time to create for my benefit. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm a bit more broad in that respect. And, and I, I want to keep it that way because I, I want my son to see it that way. When you're at a table and somebody prepared you a meal, it doesn't matter who they are. They deserve your attention. Hey, I got to agree with you, man. You know, for as many times that the three of us got together and drank a lot um, and to the outsider, it might seem that our relationship was very drink, uh, uh, drink centric, right? But it was actually food that initially brought us together. Yep. And we're always focused on food first and we tend to finish it off on drinks. And uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. It extends to the rest of our family and our family isn't always necessarily the immediate blood that's within our household, but the people that we consider really close friends, you know, my family and I, we, we aren't close today, but what I got from my family growing up eating together was that it was, it was a time together, even if we didn't speak to each other. And not only that, but it was also a, a sign and a showing of love because, you know, my parents were immigrants, they were poor and anything that they had, they poured into the food right? Any time, any money, they poured into the food to make sure that we had the best time eating. And fortunately, I picked up my mom's cooking skills, or at least maybe like 50% of it. But to me, you know, sitting down with my family and my kids and my wife and cooking them recipes of my people, of different cultures and different styles of food and sitting down and you know even with you guys when i'm sitting down and i've cooked a big meal and everybody's laughing and having fun and enjoying the food man that just that just invigorates my life you know so good that just yeah. feels my life and 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 that's what i love and you know especially with my kids now that are both in high school you know they come home and when they're enjoying their food they also open up about their days, right? We don't even have to ask them about how their day went and we're sharing, we're laughing, we're having a good time. And it's just, I know my life revolves around food. Um, there are other things that we have to do, but it's always about, Hey, what's the next meal together going to be? And, you know, who are we going to have it with and what are we going to do to make sure that man, we really enjoy our food because that's, that's what it is you know right before you got on matt andy and i we were talking about uh oh marley uh, molly mcpherson's out in richmond hill and even though we had our first experience of coila out there um we remember the food you know we we remember all of the times that we had together and, and it's funny i know that we're talking about family meals as an eating together as a family unit but you know my memories eating with you guys were all has to do, do with family style meals too, right? Mm -hmm. We always went out and we did the family style type meals and ate together as if we had grown up with each other. And not, no, you two have. But um, anyways, uh, what else you got, Matt? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, <don't laughs> <have much. laughs> he's drooling so a little I, bit. I have, I, have, I have a question for you, Matt. Like you, you had asked us um, uh, what we plan uh what we plan in the future like what what we anticipate in the future the family meals would be like ideal setting what's that ideal setting for you because currently it sounds like you can give some of your time to those family meals but often you're working through it so ideally you wouldn't be working through those family meal times how would right. how would you want that to how would you want that to be conducted and um given given your history with family meals is limited in comparison to ten and I's, has your view of what you want that family meal to be changed since we started this conversation? I don't necessarily want to say that it's changed. It's, it's what you guys say that you, you do with your families and what you would like to do with your families. So it's something that I've always wanted. And it's something, uh, you know, and uh, is this something that is taking me time to get used to, I feel like. And um, what I would like is for eventually, because right now at my job, I, I work mainly from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. I don't work too much in the mornings or in the afternoons. Uh, so my, my time zone is different. Time zone. My time is different from my family's. 
but eventually I do I would like a job where I'm working typical eight to five, nine to five, and just being able to sit down with my family and talk about our days and experiences. And, or even like you said, you want to cook with your, with your son. I would like to do that with Riley as well, or even have like on Sundays, have it be big breakfast time, you know, where we all get together and cook a big breakfast, maybe watch some, would be Sunday morning cartoons, maybe <laughs> instead of Saturday morning. Do they still have those? No, I looked for it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's night off. I think it's just Netflix now. I was going to say that's what yes. Netflix is for, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I do plan to bring it back with my kids. I, that's one thing I'd, uh, I would say that I, Saturday morning cartoons is kind of different. We didn't have that with my family. I mean, I did it with myself, but I feel like with my family, I want that to be a family time as well. Having Saturday morning cartoons where we just maybe watch Netflix, as you say, eating okay. Oreos and milk. <laughs> okay. I think that'll be nice and fun. Yeah. So, no, you know, so, so what about, what would you tell to people who COVID has been a hard time for a lot of people who had to shelter in place, didn't get access to their families. Um, and some people out there don't have the large families like we do, or, you know, the close relationships that we do, even with friends, right? What, what would you tell to people who don't have that type of relationship to, to do to get that same type of experience or similar? I know that's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> Andy, do you do anything different with your family now that you haven't seen each other? Um, actually, we on one occasion, we actually um, we did kind of a meeting like this. We wasn't on Zoom, but uh, we... It was a birthday celebration. They cooked. They're they're in, they're in Georgia. They cooked like this feast for all of them. Um, they were celebrating celebrating the birthday of one of my nieces, and they called me in. And we had the video. And Steph and I and our son, we were all there, and we were just eating our own meal too. And while we were not eating the same thing, it was it was kind of family related in the sense like we were there we were sharing the experience we were celebrating a, uh, a birthday so I mean I haven't thought about it before but I guess that's more of a modern twisted way of having a family meal when technology allows you that access uh, but COVID you know wants to shoot down your dreams and everything right and you're you guys live a few hours away from each other right uh from ten and I or my family and I my family and I are 11 hours away 11 hours ten and I are pretty much the same yeah like it takes me a little bit longer to get to Atlanta yeah yeah oh really yeah because you kind of have to like yeah yeah Yeah. Uh, and you know uh, I guess my suggestion is to go to Waffle House (laughs) because they're always open (laughs) the holidays and you can find somebody else there that you know needs some company um but yeah you know I I figured that would be one of the things you had brought up and was uh, using some type of telecommunication way to get in touch with friends or family to have these type of meals, especially uh, after your conversation last week about all the technology that you use for Alex when he was first born. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do uh, think it's interesting. Oh, sorry. You know, uh, I was ahead. saying like, Matt, you were, you were involved in a friend's giving with, uh, with Steph and I and a few other a oh, few of her friends. Yes. Um, what yes. was that? 2016, 2015. That was an experience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's, it's a different take on, um, that's a different take on family meals. And I think yeah. that's probably still relevant in COVID times. You can probably still get together with five or six friends yeah. and have yeah, a Thanksgiving. Was, especially when were you guys in Macon at that time? No, we were in, um, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Oh yeah. Michigan. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. Uh, what else you got, man? Oh, that's what I was going to say. One more thing was that, the I do think it's interesting that even with Martin, uh, my brother-in-law, um, even though he eats with us, sometimes what he likes to do is uh, he likes to watch um, people eating in Korea or in Japan. Apparently, that's a big thing where these skinny, young Korean people, they would just the have these big meals. But the mukbangs? Mukbangs. Muk mm-hmm. uh, yeah, they were just, and there's just videos of live streaming them where they just eat meals. <laughs> yep. Maybe they'll talk a little bit. Yeah. Yep. It's, I, it's uh, gross 
disturbing and slightly interesting. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> that's my my feelings as well. <laughs> I, I just I, I, I oddly it. got into uh, watching competitive eating on YouTube, uh, and it's not really a thing because uh, I was looking for a video on the Texan. Uh, the big Texan steakhouse. If uh, you guys are familiar with that, it's that place out in Amarillo, Texas with the 72 ounce uh, steak challenge. So if you can eat that and a potato and all this other shit, you get it for free, right? Otherwise you're paying 72 bucks for it. And they also uh, make really good Rocky Mountain oysters. Uh, but anyway, so I, I was looking up uh, one of the challenges and, you know, it kind of got me interested in watching people eat a humongous amount of food because, Eating sucks sometimes. <laughs> if I had 4,500 calories to blow, I'd probably start doing that too, though. That's got to be a cheaper way to go. <laughs> McDonald's. So, so who's on next week? I think uh, it's you. Ten. That's oh, you, week. man. Okay. All right. Uh, I, I guess before uh, we get into that topic, Matt, uh, what do you, you want to leave a last note for our listeners as far as your final thoughts on eating as a family and, you know, how, how that would enrich you know i i really hate to say it enrich their lives because not all of us have that same type of family dynamic right, right. yeah right. i i was thinking about that too before we started the show um i think that you know it's a family meal time i feel like is is something like i said we is keeping anything with the show is something that we may not really think much about and i think it's something that we shouldn't take for granted because like you said, not everyone has that opportunity or chance to eat a big meal with their families. And, and I think if you do have that, if you are lucky enough to have that, that experience with your family, then, um, you know, just appreciate it and just um, enjoy the moments that you can with them and try to maybe try to build up on it if you can and with, expand it with your own family as you grow up, have your own kids. All right, okay. so... So guess what? Next week's going to be super exciting, right? Because uh, we're going to talk about scalloping, especially off the coast of Florida. And it's not just going to be about scalloping. I just went back from, uh, I just came back from a trip last, uh, last weekend uh, to go out into the Gulf of Mexico. And it's weird because I always grew up calling them scallops. And then when I went down to Florida, they're called scallops, two L's. I don't know how you pronounce it. It's, it's, it sounds like a horse with a lame foot. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you know, here's the thing though, right? It's going to be, a, it's going to be a cool, cool episode because it's not just about eating scallops. It's about going out there and diving for the scallops. But at the same time, we got caught in the middle of a crazy golf storm, right? Oh. And we had the slowest ass boat out, at, out in the ocean that day. And we turtled our way back in this heavy wind and thunderstorm with lightning all around us. And it, it was, it was fantastic, man. It was like one of the most thrilling extreme scalloping trips that anybody has ever been on. Extreme, extreme scalloping. Yeah. Extreme scalloping. <laughs> and, and you know, it, it, the way we did it was we, we, uh, we had my, my family and my sister and her husband to come out and rent a pontoon to uh, take our boat out to the scallop beds. But there are other areas in Florida where you can simply take a kayak and where a kayak rental might only be $45. And if you guys ever had naturally caught scallops, bay scallops, man, they're amazing. They're not anything like what you buy in the store, right? Uh, which is really cool. And they also protect them from being commercialized. So every single year between July and September, all of the tourists comes in and the scallops come back into the beds and you just dive down. And, you know, we were, we were about 11, 12 miles off of the coast and the scallop beds were only about five to 10 feet deep. So you just bring your snorkel gear out there, you anchor up and you just jump down and just kind of snatch them up from the ground and, you know, bring them home and cook them up. It's pretty cool. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Sounds, all right. I'm excited. Fun. Yep. So <laughs> Matt, you want to sign us off? All right. That was our episode of uh, In Plain Sight. Hope you enjoyed it and have a good evening. Have a good morning. <laughs> All right, See you guys. Guys, next week, guys. <laughs>